This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. Welcome, everyone. My name is Darren Hood. This is the inaugural episode of the World of UX. I'm going to be your host for the podcast, and I'm excited and honored to spend time speaking to you on a weekly basis to help provide insights and answer questions about all things user experience. Through these podcasts, it will be my goal to cover any and all topics that we could possibly imagine on this subject. Through these brief segments, I hope to educate, I hope to inspire, I hope to invigorate, I hope to clarify, I hope to sharpen saws, I hope to expand horizons, and I hope to build you. All for the good of user experience. Those experienced in the discipline will get refreshers, while those learning will improve their perspectives on UX. Many will learn about UX's value and what's in it for them to practice UX and or embrace its fruit, if you will. Before we dive into today's content, how about I introduce myself and share a little bit about me. I've been engaged officially in the world of UX since 1996, when I designed my first website. I began contributing to what we now know as UX during my day job in 1998 and landed my first full-time UX related position as an information architect for a large company in the banking industry in 2005. I hold a master's from Syracuse University in information management specializing in user needs, a master's from Kent State University in user experience design, a graduate certificate in educational technology from Michigan State University, and I'm currently pursuing a PhD in educational leadership from North Central University. I also serve as an adjunct professor at Kent State University for that same UX design master's program that I graduated from and located in Kent, Ohio. And I serve as an adjunct at Lawrence Technological University in Southfield, Michigan. My professional footprint is pretty vast. It includes working for or with such companies as Ford Motor Company, General Motors, Bosch, Ryder, United Shore, Quicken Loans, Fathead, OnStar, Cengage Learning, National Geographic Learning, IBM, Unisys, Covacent, Jiffy Lube, Duracell, and Caterpillar as well as such digital design powerhouses as Digitas LBI, which is part of the Publicis Group, Global Team Blue, formerly known as Team Detroit, and Wonderman, which is part of the WPP group of agencies, and MRM McCann, which is part of the Interpublic Group. I've also reviewed book manuscripts for Morgan Kaufman. Many of you might be familiar with me because I tend to speak at a lot of conferences as well as for other podcasts. If you don't already know me, how about we sum it up like this? I'm extremely passionate about all things UX, and I'm fully dedicated to the maturation and the well-being of the discipline as well as its practitioners. So, that said, let's go ahead and dive into our first topic for the worlds in UX, which is appropriately... What is UX? A lot of people have this question. What would you say if I told you that there's a discipline where you could invest a dollar and for every dollar that you invest, you get a return on that investment of $100? How about $240 or $250? What would you say if I told you that there's a discipline where your KPIs can be improved by up to 83%. Your key performance indicators, those things that you use to measure success in your company could be improved that vastly. Would you be interested? 
Would you want to establish a group in your company that could bring this discipline in and get these things to work so that you can start to see these benefits for your organization? Well, folks, that's UX. And that's the value that it brings to the table. Before we dive in and get to some of the detail, and I really start to paint more of a picture of what UX is about and how you can receive those ROIs, how about we talk about what UX is not? I like to tear things down before I build. It doesn't make sense to build something on top of some things that shouldn't exist. So let's structure this building properly, if you will, and let's talk for a few minutes about what UX is not. First, in this world of UX, a lot of people think that it focuses only on aesthetics. A lot of companies have UX departments. A lot of companies have UX personnel. But unfortunately, a lot of times, the UX person is brought in and it's thought that the UX person is simply going to focus on making what you're working on look better. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Number two, a lot of people will mention UX UI. I'm sure many of you have heard that before. Let's get the UX UI person in here. That actually is, it would be inaccurate. UX is not UI. UI is a subset of UX as you're going to learn over the course of these podcasts, it's a subset, but it's not UX. And you're going to find that UX is a broader operation. Number three, UX is not just one thing. A lot of times people will will say, well, let's just get some UX involved on this, or let's get some UX applied to it without really having the knowledge of what UX is and on a future podcast, I'm going to spend some time talking about what I call the four pillars. There are four major pillars associated with UX. That's usability and heuristics, information architecture, UX research, and there's up to 96 different ways to conduct research, 96 different methods and methodologies. And then there's interaction and interface design. And within that interaction and interface design is where UI lives. The UX side of things when it comes to the user interface is about how it's used, making sure it's easy to use as possible, that everything's following the appropriate best practices. But UX is not UI, and it's not just one thing. It is a culmination of several disciplines and methods and methodologies. But we'll talk about that again a little bit. UX is not design thinking. In 2020, a lot of companies have engaged in design thinking, and the belief is that they're engaging in UX, when the truth is that design thinking is simply, even going all the way back to its inception, was about simply getting stakeholders involved in a collaborative exercise to try to get everyone to think more about the user. It was done in an attempt to make the design process more user-centered as well as making it more of a collective and a collaborative work and not just the designers only. But the bottom line is that once you get that information from people, which is what we were doing before design thinking became popular anyway, get input from the subject matter experts, and then still let the designers go and do the job. That's actually the better way to do things. We do need input from those subject matter experts. We wouldn't get anywhere without them. But we just need to understand that UX is not design thinking. And truth be told, design thinking is not UX. It's just a tool that we can use, but it must be used properly. Next, UX is not UX if it doesn't include insights from actual users. The users put the U in UX, if you will. It may sound corny, but it's true. If you attempt to design without input from users, you're going to fall short. If you attempt to design without finding out what their pain points are, or striving to obtain understanding of their mental models, you're going to fall short. 
companies that engage in user-centered design principles have been said to outperform their competition by anywhere from 216 to 228 percent in studies that have been conducted over the last few years. That is a lot of profit, <laughs> if you will. And it's because, again, those principles are in place because UX is being practiced in a proper way. These companies that are outperforming the competition are not just throwing design thinking at their work, and they're not just coming up with some some quick microwave-oriented type of, of strategy or engagement. They're actually taking the time to execute properly, and they have the right people doing the right things. And as a result, the winners are the users, the winners are the developers that are putting the solutions together, the winners are the companies, the winners are the stakeholders. And it's all because they embraced the principles and they went forward in the right manner. Lastly, UX is not limited to digital products. We need to know and understand this. It's not just websites. UX is not limited to impacting your mobile applications, your tablet experiences. UX can be applied to hardware as well as software or web-oriented solutions. So, again, this is what UX is not. It doesn't just focus on aesthetics. It's not UI. It's not just one thing. It's several things. It's not design thinking, nor is design thinking UX. And UX is not UX if it doesn't include insights from actual users. And lastly, UX is not limited to digital products in its application. So that said, what is UX? Now that we've pulled up all the weeds and we've cleaned out the area where we want to erect this building, what exactly is UX? So there are three definitions, three mindsets that I'd like to share with you today in defining this. Number one, UX is an application of several methods and methodologies, as we've been saying a little bit already that are geared at optimizing ease of use. There's your, your keyword. Ease of use for different types of solutions. So UX, in its simplest form, is about ease of use. That, however, if you focus on that only and just look at that, you still might fall short. So definition number two will provide a little bit more color. I want you to picture a Venn diagram. And in this Venn diagram, there are three segments. The first one is user needs. The second one is the business needs. And the third one is constraints. Not just technological constraints. There might be political constraints. There might be other types of constraints that come into play. UX can be thought of as that vehicle, that discipline or set of disciplines that a UX professional will employ to find the sweet spot in that Venn diagram between the user goals, the business goals, and the various types of constraints. That's what we labor to do. The user experience professional brings a certain degree of prowess, skill, and knowledge to the table. The stakeholders, the business owners, different people involved in that arena are going to bring a set of knowledge from the business side of things and help to keep the ship righted, if you will, by keeping that information at the forefront, listed with the requirements. And then you have your constraints. And constraints could be any one of a number of, of, of categories, if you will come from any one of a number of categories. But eventually, as you navigate across all three, you find a sweet spot. And so UX is this, is this discipline that's directing traffic and helping us to accomplish what we need to accomplish from a sense of realism as well as a sense of practicality. So that's number two. Number three, and this is a big one because this one is where there's a lot of discrepancy with regard to people's perceptions about UX. UX is a science and the art of designing a product, a service, and or an experience with a brand 
from end to end. From the beginning, when a person, a customer, a client, a user is exposed to your brand from that moment all the way through the use of the solution and then beyond that into the support funnel where they may need help periodically, when they get there, they are still within the reach of a properly structured user experience. And then what if you have new products? What if that product has a shelf life that's coming to its end? When that happens, you want to make sure that the ability to get that person back into the purchasing funnel or to upgrade, maybe they need to be ups, upsold on something, UX will help facilitate that. People think it's just sales. They think it's just customer support. They think it's just someone else that has some type of relationship management a, a task or responsibility. UX touches all of these things. Some companies allow it to, some companies don't. But but truth is that UX touches all these things. So again, UX is this element that brings value through its methods and its methodologies. It tries to find a sweet spot in the Venn diagram and it consists of science and art. The reason I mentioned the discrepancy is because people focus on the art and in focusing on the art, they lose the fact or just do not know or understand that there's a science behind it. And so that's critically important. When all of this is done, UX provides the following benefits. It optimizes the ease of use, as we mentioned earlier, for products and services. It fosters better client loyalty and goodwill. It provides companies with competitive advantage or it improves it. It reduces costs associated with development and customer support. And then lastly, yes, it improves conversion rates. I'd like to, as we get ready to wrap up here, remind you of a company. I'll name drop this company and you likely have all heard of it. It's called Airbnb. According to the history of Airbnb, that company was really on its way out. They were not doing well. They were suffering dramatically in their, in their operation. They finally took time to look at things from a user perspective, and the company grew astronomically, and you know where Airbnb is today. That company was saved. They were put on everyone's roadmaps. They were put in a position to succeed. They innovated. They, they paid attention to what the user needs were. They discovered what the user's mental models were, which in, involves the expectations that a person has when they engage with your product or service or brand. They got a strong understanding of those things, and they changed the way that they were doing business to better meet the needs and better match customer expectations. And now... Today, we see that it is one of the most valuable companies in the world. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what UX can do for you. So, if you ever had a, the mindset that UX was simply something to make things look better, and as one person put it once in describing UX, they figured that doing UX is like tying shoes. And as a person who's been in the field now, a first-generation UXer, I'm here to tell you, UX is much more than tying shoes. That's all the time that we have for today. I'm hoping that you enjoyed the podcast, this introductory session. Uh, thank you for joining me on today, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to share some things that will enlighten you and sharpen your saw and help you to understand the value and the purpose, the structure, and the function of this thing that we call UX user experience. It's a wonderful vehicle, a wonderful tool that uh, when done correctly has a lot of great benefits in store for its practitioners and for those who adopt it. So again, I'm Darren Hood, your host for the world of UX. Thanks for joining me again on today and I hope to EU next time on the world of UX. Happy UXing everybody.
Thanks for joining us for this session of CX of M Radio. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.